we have completed the eight sessions. Today, the ninth session. And the first session we took was on the uh, deliverance from guilt. Uh, how to the cross we deliver from every guilt that may be holding us. Second session was on deliverance from the evil one. Third, freedom from fears and anxieties. Then we spoke about destruction of death, how Jesus destroyed death on the cross. And then the fifth session was uh, comfort and encouragement. Sixth session, wisdom and strength. Seventh session was freedom from curses. Eighth session was coming of the kingdom of God. That was on Thursday. Today is the ninth session. It is on fellowship with God. I have one more session on this series. That will be on Tuesday. That will be assurance of salvation. <coughs> Today's topic is fellowship with God. How through the cross, we have this amazing privilege of having fellowship with God. And therefore, let's value this fellowship with God. So often we take uh, our relationship with God for granted. We don't realize what a privilege it is for us to be having fellowship with God. And we tend to take it lightly, this amazing call God has for us to have fellowship with him. Now, fellowship with God, we take it for granted today, but we must understand in Old Testament time, it was no easy thing to have fellowship with God. They could not approach God with confidence because in the temple in Jerusalem, once in a year, the high priest would take the blood of the covenant into the holy place and only by the blood he could enter the holy place and even that was a lot of anxiety because if the sacrifice is not done properly, the high priest would die in God's presence and therefore there would be a lot of anxiety when the high priest approached once in a year the holy of holies. And uh, Hebrews 10, chapter verse 4 says, it was impossible the death of, of, of the blood of goats and bulls to take away sin. It was impossible. But then God had ordained in the Old Testament time that blood has been given as atonement for sins. Leviticus 17, 11. And animal sacrifice was symbolic of the Messiah, the Passover lamb. So they offered sacrifices. And once in a year, the high priest entered the most holy place. And when I enter the most holy place, there will be a lot of anxiety outside. Because if the sacrifice was not done properly, then the high priest would die in God's presence. And nobody can go inside and pull the body out. So they would tie a rope to the leg of the high priest and his effort would have a lot of bells on it. So in the, in the Holy of Holies, when there was bells uh, tolling, and he was this movement going around, they know that he's alive. So they be, uh, they comforted. But if he dies in God's presence, nobody can go in and pull out the body. So they'll tie a rope to the leg and pull the body out <clears throat> because nobody can enter the most holy place without the blood. It's an awesome <clears throat> occasion entering the most holy place those days. Now the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament sacrifices pertaining to sacrifice for sins. He is the fulfillment. And when he came, came to the world, he came both as a sacrifice and also as a high priest who would offer the sacrifice. <clears throat> And when he was crucified on the cross, the Bible says that in the temple in Jerusalem, the curtain the temple tore into from top to bottom. 27th chapter of Matthew, verse 51 says, as he hung on the cross, the curtain of the temple in Jerusalem <coughs> tore into from top to bottom. Meaning, anybody could enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Till then, only the high priest would enter once in a year. After sacrificing their own sins, 
for the sins of the people outside. But when Christ was crucified, the curtain tore in two. Which means anybody can enter the most holy place. The Jews or Gentiles or lepers or anybody at all. Because the way has been made, a new way to enter the most holy place. So Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 19 we read. Since we are conference to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Let's draw clear to, uh, near to God with confidence, a new way to enter the most holy place. In the Old Testament time, in the tabernacle when they came from Egypt, whenever they camped on the plains of Moab or wherever they camped along the way from Egypt to Canaan, in the center of that uh, camping would be the tent of meeting, where Moses would go there and talk to God. Exodus 33rd chapter 9 to 13 talks about how at the tent of meeting, he would go to the tent of meeting and all the Israelites would be outside their own tents, watching Moses as he went to the tent of meeting. Whenever Moses went to the tent of meeting, the Bible says, God would descend upon the tent in a pillar of cloud. When Moses went, God came upon the tent, not the other way around. Which means, any time God is willing to talk to Moses, it depended upon Moses, it didn't depend upon God. Whenever he went, God came to talk to him, to have fellowship with him. And Joshua, assistant of Moses, would never leave the tent of meeting. He was a very uh, uh, eavesdropper, an enthusiastic eavesdropper of whatever happened between God and Moses. He would not leave the tent because he wanted to know what's going on between God and Moses. Whenever Moses went, God came. God was always willing to talk to Moses, to commune with him as a man talks to his friend face to face. All the revelations of God in the Old Testament time, including to Moses, were all Jesus. The one who accompanied Moses along the way from Egypt was actually the Christ. You don't realize that. Bible says in John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten Son, who the Father said, has made him known. First Timothy First chapter, 16th verse says, <clears throat> God lives in unapproachable light. No one ever has seen or can see him. That referring to the Father in heaven. So if no one has ever seen God, whom did people see in the Old Testament time? They saw Jesus. Explained by John, John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten Son, who the Father said has made him known. <coughs> also, we read, in Romans chapter 12, 3 and 4, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 and 4, it says, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ, who accompanied Israelites from Egypt to the land of Canaan. So in the tent of meeting, Whenever Moses went tent of meeting, God would appear there in the form of Jesus and converse with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. All that in the Old Testament time. But in the New Testament, you will read how God has opened a new way for every one of us to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. So when you go to God in prayer, you say, Father, I come to you by the blood of Jesus. Number one. Number two, in the name of Jesus. Ephesians 3 12 says about Jesus, in him and through faith in him, 
we can approach God with freedom and confidence. He's always willing to talk to us. He loves to talk to us. He loves to have fellowship with us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 8 and 9 says, He will keep us strong till the very end. That we blend with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who called you into fellowship with the Son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. He has called us to have fellowship with him. And we'll do well to constantly choose to have fellowship with him. And the conference we have is the way he has made for us to go to him. By his blood, he has cleansed us of every sin. And therefore, when he says, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, <coughs> we are in God's presence, in spirit. And then, it's important for us to ask the Holy Spirit to show us any areas in our heart that we are displeasing to him. Light and darkness cannot have anything in common. With sin, they cannot approach God confidently. And the Holy Spirit who lives in us is a counselor. He helps us put away every iota of sin in our hearts. So for effective prayer, effective fellowship with God, he has made a way by which we can have fellowship with God, it's important for us to approach the Father in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, and take the help of the Holy Spirit to put away every iota of sin in our hearts. In God's presence, all our secret sins are all illuminated. They are revealed. In Psalm 90 verse 8, the psalmist says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. In God's presence, no sin is secret. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, Nothing in all creation hidden from God's sight. Everything uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we have to give an account. So we cannot hide from God. We will do well to face up to God, simply acknowledge his holiness, our own unholiness, and say, Lord, you change my unholiness and make me holy. We have to come clean before God all the time, not try to hide from God. In the Old Testament time, David, for some time, tried to hide from God. It's futile, tried to hide from God. Nothing is hidden from God. In Psalm 32, 3, 4, and 5, he writes, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as the heat of summer. Then I told my sin to you, did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Much before Christ entered the world, David, in the context of guilt, sin, and guilt, he tried to hide from God for some time. Then he faced up to God. Being a man after God's own heart, he knew in the heart of God is a plan to send the Messiah to the world. And he faced up to the Messiah. And he was forgiven of his guilt. So forgave the guilt of my sin. What a lesson for us. No point trying to hide from God. In the book of Jeremiah, 23rd chapter, 23-24, God says, Am I only a God nearby, not a God for far away? Can anyone hide in secret because I don't see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? He knows everything. Let's just come clean before God all the time. So when you want to have fellowship time with God, he has to have confidence to enter his presence. In the name of Jesus, Ephesians 3.12, by the blood of Jesus, Hebrews 10.19. And then we ask Holy Spirit to counsel us when he reveals anything in our hearts displeasing to him, 
let us put them away. In Psalm 139, 23 and 24, David writes, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if any offensive weigh me and lead me in the way everlasting. Sometimes Christians, they wait for one month before they check their hearts, before they throw away sin. That happens when they take communion. Many churches, once in a month they take communion. So what do Christians do? They examine themselves and make sure that every sin in the heart is removed. Then they take communion. You have to wait for one month before you put away sin. Just to take communion. As and when sin creeps in, we have to put it away. Have the desire, the willingness to come out of it completely. Sometimes we're struggling with sin. When the willingness is there, God will give us the enabling. He wants to see willingness in our hearts to put away every iota of sin. And God will draw us out of it. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteous, unrighteousness. Not only He forgives our sins, He purifies from all unrighteousness. So let's not try to avoid God. <coughs> it's futile trying to avoid God. It's a wasteful exercise. They're only deceiving us to think God doesn't know. He knows everything. When you face up to God of holiness, whether of unholiness, He will reveal unholiness to us and He will draw us out of unholiness. He longs to be gracious towards us. He remembers we are dust. He knows that we are dust. And therefore, he draws us out of sin. So very important for us to be absolutely coming clean before God. And acknowledge that it's only by his grace we can come out of sin. And Jesus is the one who draws us out of sin. Hebrews 2.18 says, because he himself suffered while being tempted, is able to help those being tempted. So for us to have a meaningful fellowship with God, we have to put away every iota of sin and thank him for giving us the strength and learn to enjoy your fellowship. Our relationship with God is based on his love for us. And let's remember his love for you for you to draw close to God. In Jeremiah 31, 3, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with a loving kindness. So in your prayer time, ask yourself, how much of time you spend enjoying God's presence? How much of time you spend making petitions to God? Give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. And how much of time you spend Listening to the voice of God. Fellowship is two-way communication. We talk to him, he talks to us. That is fellowship. And every one of us is called to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians 13, 14 says, Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. The Holy Spirit takes from Jesus and makes known to us. In John 16, 14, Jesus said that about the Holy Spirit. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making known to you. He reveals to us. The will of the Father, Jesus' words to us, he reveals to us. Also, he enables us to pray according to the will of God. Romans 8, 26, 27. The same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what you ought to pray. But the Spirit said this for us, we're going through the words can't express. And he who knows the hearts of men knows the mind of the Spirit. 
for the spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will of god <coughs> the holy spirit help us to pray according to god's will and will take him these and make known to us so fellowship with the holy spirit means we are able to commune with god any time anywhere any place there's no particular posture by which we have to pray and the people make rules and regulations about how to pray some churches they only kneel down and pray some churches they sit and pray they are all scriptural healing is very scriptural jesus knelt and prayed in the garden of gethsemane for some time he knelt and prayed for some time he lay prostrate and prayed verse 6 chapter of matthew 29 he lay prostrate luke 22 42 it says he knelt and prayed Paul knelt and prayed, Ephesians three fourteen. King Jehoshaphat stood and prayed, Second Chronicles twenty eight chapter verse five. Then read about Moses. He lay prostrate and prayed and prayed. Numbers chapter sixteen verse four. David sat and prayed, Second Samuel seven eighteen. He sat and prayed. They are all scriptural, sitting. Standing, kneeling, lying prostrate—all are scriptural. So don't get be dogmatic about the posture of prayer. What matters is, are we praying with sincerity? Are we praying led by the Spirit? And are we listening more to God than talking to Him? Ecclesiastes chapter five, from verse one, we read. Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse one onwards. Solomon writes, <clears throat> "Guard your steps when you go to the house of the Lord. Go near to listen and offer the sacrifice of fools. Don't be quick with the mouth and hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven; you are on earth. Let your words be few." And verse seven says, "Stand in awe of God." Stand in awe of Him, revere Him. For effective prayer, it has to be a reverential obedience. Jesus' prayers were heard because of His reverent submission. Hebrews chapter five verse seven says, "To the days of this life on earth, He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears <coughs> to one who could save from death." And he was heard because of his reverent submission. In the reverently submit to the will of the Father, we'll have confidence of our prayers being heard. So to have a meaningful fellowship with God, it's important to put away every hindrance that comes in the way of our fellowship with God. One of the most primary hindrances come is the common ways. Laziness, lethargy. Christian life is one of discipline. We are soldiers for Christ, and every soldier in any army anywhere in the world is disciplined. If we discipline ourselves to be proactively spending time with God, and take pains to put away every hindrance in our meaningful fellowship with God. Light and darkness cannot have fellowship. So when you are walking in the light, we have fellowship with God. If you are walking in darkness, we can't have fellowship. We can fake it, but it's not genuine fellowship. Whereas when we put away every iota of sin, we can enjoy our fellowship with God and participate in the divine nature. Let me share with you, which I shared before also. Many things comes in the way of our meaningful fellowship with God, which prevents us from enjoying our time with God, and also things that come in the way of our prayers being heard. <coughs> There are some hindrances that we face for our prayers to be heard by the Lord. When we put away these hindrances, we we'll have confidence of our prayers being heard. This does not mean God won't hear our prayers. He is a gracious God. 
he answers our prayers because he loves us. But when we put away the hindrances, we'll have confidence he's heard our prayers. I'm going to identify all these points, six points, which come in the way of confidence to have our prayers, have confidence that prayers are heard and he'll answer. The first hindrance is cherishing sin. Cherishing sin. Regarding iniquity in our hearts. In Psalm 66, verse 18, the psalmist says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, God would not have listened. Regarding iniquity means wanting to continue in sin, cherishing it. We all sin in so many ways, but do we cherish it? Do you want to continue? If you want to continue, you won't have confidence of prayers being heard. So Psalm 66, verse 18 says, if I cherish in my heart, God will not listen. A second hindrance that prevents us from having meaningful fellowship with the Father is basically lack of faith. Matthew 21, 22 says, if you believe, receive whatever you ask for in prayer. If you believe. What you ask for in prayer, if you believe, you have, you have received it. So by faith, we have confidence of our prayers being heard. Faith that God hears our prayers. He loves to hear our prayers. A third hindrance is lack of knowledge of the will of God. In 1 John chapter 5, 14, 15, John writes, this is a concept we have in approaching God. We ask that God is will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know, we receive what we asked of him. Confidence in asking for God, you know, asking for prayers, is knowing that what you're asking is according to the will of God. When you pray according to the will of God, we'll have confidence of a prayers being heard. Now, for us to have confidence to know the will of God, we should know the word of God. The word of God reveals the will of God. In John 15, 7, Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. To remain in me, remaining in him means obeying him. 1 John 3, 24. Those who obey his commandments live in him and he in them. This is how we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. We abide in him through obedience. He abides in us through his spirit. So when you live according to the word of God, we remain in him. His word remains in us. Whatever you ask, we will get. Because we are asking according to the will of God. According to the word of God. The word of God reveals the will of God. So first hindrance is cherishing sin. Number two, lack of faith. Number three, lack of knowledge of will of God. Number four, lack of knowledge of word of God, by which we can know the will of God. Number five, when we ask God something, the wrong motivation. In James chapter four, two and three, we read, you ask and don't receive because you ask the wrong motives. To spend what you have on your pleasures. Wrong motivation. <coughs> we ask for the right thing. We ask for the right thing, but the wrong motivation. You don't have confidence of prayers being heard. Our motivation for asking God for anything should be whatever He gives us must be for His glorifying His name and edifying His people. Glorifying His name, edifying His people. That's number five. Wrong motivation. Number six, bitterness. Bitterness hinders grace. You take bitterness very rightly sometimes. We justify ourselves by saying, I have right to be bitter with this person. He's harmed me so much, I can't love this person. I am very bitter. Now, if you look at 11th chapter Mark, 24-25, we read, Whatever you ask for in prayer, be received it, it will be yours. And when you stand praying, you remember you heard anything in city one, forgive him. 
the Father in heaven will forgive you. So when you stand praying, remember you have something against someone, go and make peace, forgive him. Otherwise, it's going to hinder your prayers. Fellowship with God means fellowship with the God who is the personification of love. 1 John 4.16 God is love. How can you have fellowship with the God of love if we have bitterness? Bitterness is darkness. God is light. There's no, nothing in common. <coughs> and therefore, when we try to pray to God one-to-one -one, with bitterness, we are deceiving ourselves. We are fooling ourselves. No point. Remember, we are all enemies of God once. He loved us while well as still enemies. Colossians 1.21 says, we are enemies of God. Well, enemies of God, he loved us. And therefore, there is no question of having bitterness and expecting God to hear your prayers. We hinder our fellowship with God. He'll say, you first make peace and come to me. I am the personification of love. I have loved you, so you will love others. And that love is a love in the spirit. God gives us that love. In fact, faith in Christ, genuine faith in Christ will result in love for each other. <clears throat> in the church in Galatia, there was a problem of the Judaic believers confusing Gentile believers about keeping the Old Testament law. And the Apostle Paul addresses the issue. Galatians chapter 5 or 6. They were told, the Gentiles were told, you must obey the law of Moses, you must keep the Sabbath, you must be circumcised, all rules and regulations. And Paul writes and says, 5th chapter of Galatians verse 6, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision any value what matters is faith expressing itself through love. Faith in Christ will result in love for each other. It's natural, spontaneous. And therefore, ask God for that love. And uh, when you manifest that love, you can't have bitterness. Six symptoms I've shared with you for all Christians. Number one, cherishing sin. Number two, lack of faith. Number three, not asking God the will of God. Number four, not knowing the word of God. Number five, wrong motivation. Number six, bitterness. And number seven is primarily for husbands. In First Peter, chapter three, verse seven, Peter writes to husbands. Husbands, be considered as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as weaker partners and as with you of the great, gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. <coughs> so when a husband doesn't treat his wife properly, not respectful, his prayers are going to be hindered. So why keep all these hindrances? Just throw them away. It's not worth keeping all these hindrances. Especially bitterness. Bitterness eats us up from inside. Put away. Completely put away. You are set free to serve him. And when you reverently submit to the will of God, we can enjoy our fellowship with God. And I would suggest to you that the best time for you to spend, have fellowship with God is early in the morning. After a night's sleep, you are fresh in the morning. And say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I come to enjoy you, Lord. Please learn to enjoy God's presence. He longs for us. We are God's inheritance. We are God's inheritance. He longs for us. He longs to have fellowship with, with us. So often you go to ask, go to God to ask him for things. Give me, give me, give me, give me. And every time you go to ask, go to God and ask about things, next time you go and say, what do you want this time? How about telling God, Lord, I've come to you just for me to enjoy your presence, for you to enjoy me. Please never forget, we are God's inheritance. Psalm 94 verse 40. God will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. 
He will never forsake his inheritance. He's waiting for the time we'll go to heaven, be with him in heaven forever and ever. But there's no crying, mourning, sorrow, pain, nor death. Only eternal fellowship with God. What are we going to enjoy the eternal fellowship with God? And therefore, let's thank him for the privilege of enjoying him here itself in this world itself. Only to the cross we have this privilege. It's a legacy of the cross. At any time, anywhere, any place, in any form, any posture, sitting, standing, walking, lying prostrate, kneeling, <coughs> you can approach God in freedom and confidence and take his counsel to put away every hindrance that comes in the way of us enjoying God. He loves us with an everlasting love. He draws us to him through his loving kindness. That's a God we serve. So let's enjoy this fellowship with God. Our entire life and ministry should ideally flow from this relationship. It's a relationship. That's why when the apostles were released from prison by the angel, they were told in Acts 5.20, Go stand the temple course and tell the people the full message of this new life. New life. It's a new life, not a new religion. A relationship established by the blood of Christ, by the cross of Christ. So thank him for the cross. Always be thanking God for the cross. And remember the legacy of the cross. So many aspects of the legacy. I'm so thrilled. In fact, today the ninth session. I have one more session on, on Tuesday. Assurance of salvation, the very important topic because even now after so many two or two years of two and a half years of doing every week meetings, I still get questions from people. Will I lose my salvation? How can I be sure of my salvation? So once and for all, please get it into our hearts and minds. Salvation is a gift. We are assured of our salvation. I'm going to speak at length on that on Tuesday. After Tuesday, anytime anyone asks questions, I'm simply going to refer them to this message. That's all. I'm going to refer them to this message. Go listen to that message. I'm going to thorough study on assurance of salvation. It's a gift of God. Once he gives the gift, he won't take back. But the gift of God also <clears throat> is that we can choose to have constant fellowship with him. Anytime, anywhere, any place, in any posture. He's only one prayer away. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. We are in his presence. He loves to hear from us. And more than talking to God, please learn to listen to God. Much of my prayer time is enjoying God. I do ask him to speak to me, but sometimes he doesn't speak to me. I talk to him, of course, especially if other people I pray, I talk out my, for myself also I pray. But I love for him to talk to me. He does speak sometimes, but sometimes doesn't speak. But most of my fellowship time is enjoying God's presence. And anytime you feel different to approach God, sometimes you wonder, no, Lord, I've done so many wrong things. Lord, how can I approach you, Lord? You're holy God. God says, yes, I made a way by which you can come to me by my blood. I've cleansed your spirit of every sin by my blood. <coughs> Hebrews 10, 14. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We're all being made holy. Made perfect once and for all. That perfection was done on the cross by the blood of Jesus. <coughs> and after being made perfect by his blood, in practical Christian life, we're being set apart in different areas of our life. Different areas, we were earlier not holy, now we are holy. Being made holy. But please never put confidence in your own holiness. Always put confidence in the grace to be given you. This has revealed. It's only by grace. But because we have grace, we are called to live a holy life. 
but never allow anything to come in the way of your fellowship. Just see one prayer away. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. You have made a way by which I can come to you, Lord. Conference, Lord, to enter your most holy place. And then worship him, praise him, thank him, enjoy him. Remember who he is to you, who you are to him. I always remember that. Who God is to me, who I am to God. These two don't change. So all the time we can worship him and praise him and thank him because he's always the same. Malachi 3.6 I, the Lord, do not change. So fellowship with him, meaning two-way communication, talking to him, hearing from him, is a legacy of the cross. Without the cross, he'd be nowhere, cut off completely. But thank God, even though we're Gentiles, he's made a way. We can freely enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. I go back to the passage, Hebrews 10 chapter from verse 19. So they confess to the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Open first to the curtain, there is his body. So the great high priest of the house of God, let's draw near to God with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith can draw closer and closer to God. And as we draw closer and closer to God, let's also exhort other people to also draw close to God. And let, let's never try to do what David did for some time, to try to exercise of trying to avoid God. Nobody can avoid God. When you face up to him who is holy, is there unholiness? He will reveal unholiness to us and change us to become a holy people. Always change comes from him. He remembers we are dust. But thank him, even though we are dust, in this dust or jar of clay is a treasure, the Lord Jesus Christ, who works in us and makes us more and more like him. <clears throat> May God bless each one of us as we take this fellowship with God very, very seriously and we be proactive in our fellowship with God, not be lethargic, but rather cherish every time we have spent. We spend time with God. And remember, <coughs> we most went to the tent of meeting, God came upon the tent in a pillar of cloud. When Moses went, God came, not the other way around. Always God is willing to talk to us, to speak to us, for us to listen to him, to enjoy him. And our life and mystery ideally must flow from our relationship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for everyone, the Zoom, Lord. I thank you, love, everlasting love. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being able to have fellowship with you, Lord. True fellowship with you, Lord, through the cross. Thank you for the legacy of the cross, Lord. You can approach you, Lord, freedom, freedom and confidence anytime, anywhere, any place. Give us the inclination, Lord, to enjoy your presence, Lord. To have meaningful time of prayer with you, Lord. And Lord, be a blessing as you bless us, Lord. I come with everyone to your hands, Lord, to the word of your grace, Lord. In Jesus' precious and matchless name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.